Welcome to this quick tutorial on checking your reserve pay. My name is Jesse Matthews. I am the Local 4094 Reserve Committee Chairperson based here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Just before we start, a quick little disclaimer as seen at the bottom right. The gist of it is that this is uh, for educational purposes only. Any discrepancy between this presentation and the collective agreement, um, it can be assumed that the collective agreement will take precedence and any final interpretation from the collective agreement, uh, if clarification is needed, can be provided by your elected union officials, uh, all the way up to and including our component president, who has the ultimate say on interpreting the collective agreement. So let's start out with uh, looking at the layout of our flight summaries. This flight summary that we get every month is a breakdown of our pay statement. So when people talk about checking their paychecks, what they are really talking about is uh, looking at their flight summary to ensure that everything has been covered um, for what makes it into their pay. I'm going to start out with uh, highlighting a few of the key areas to be familiar with so that you can navigate your flight summary and calculate everything without a problem. So this is for my June 2017 block month. This was one of the first months that I flew. There just happens to be a little bit of variety here uh, so that we can talk about some of the uh, different um, things that you will see show up on your reserve pay statement. The first header um, of all the major headers is flight information. You can see that with all the dashes off to the sides on either side. And then underneath it, you'll start to see some of the subheaders. The first column, this is short for index. Each item that shows up in flight information has an index number, starting with one, as you can see with the arrow pointed there, and then it goes all the way down to 20 for the number of items that show up on this particular flight summary for me. Index numbers will definitely be important for us as uh, those directly correlate to the way that your pay is calculated once we get into the pay portion of your uh, flight summary. The next section is titled Actual and for this um, overall column area, it's broken down into several um, sub-columns. We have departure and arrival, and that corresponds to the departure time and the arrival time, respectively, for any of the index items. And this is going to reflect the local time zone uh, for whichever airport uh, each of these index items corresponds to. Finally, it gets broken down further into date and time, both of which are fairly self-explanatory. For index item number one, for example, we can see that June the 1st, this particular item started at 12.19 a.m. and then it finished at 8.01 a.m. Next we have a scheduled departure date. You're not usually going to need this in particular. Um, but it is there for your reference in case you happen to need it, but it's already covered 
um, by the previous two on the left. Except the only difference is this is what's scheduled and the left shows what is actual. And as we all know, there are delays, so sometimes that can change. Flight number, again, is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, this is going to indicate any corresponding flight number to the index item. So for index item number one, the flight number is 182. I happen to know as a Vancouver-based person, 182 um, is usually Vancouver, Toronto, and um, at this particular time, 182 was a red eye. So. Uh, 12 19 a.m. was the departure time in Pacific time, and then 8 01 a.m. was the arrival time in Eastern time. End flight number is just a little bit different. Um, it's pretty much always going to be the same as the flight number to the left of it. In this case, it just happens to be an additional way of signaling to us when looking at our flight summaries that this is the last um, piece of activity related to a particular duty day. So in this case, um, this is a way of signaling to me when I look at this that index item number one is the only one of the items that constituted this particular duty day. So I don't need to look for anything else that corresponds to this duty day. As long as uh, all of my minimum requirements are met as far as DPG, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, then the only thing that I'll need as far as um, calculation for legality of duty day and any bonuses uh, and such would just be based on this flight alone. Departure station and arrival station both are fairly straightforward. That's going to be the airport that you depart from and then the airport that you arrive to. Flight minutes indicates the length of the flight in minutes. And this brings us to the first point uh, in the bullet points that I have listed on the top right. Pay is calculated using minutes, not hours. So something to get used to when looking over your flight summary is that everything is listed in minutes, but we are used to thinking about everything in hours and minutes. And that's primarily because of Globe Mobile and the desktop version of Globe where we get to see everything listed uh, in standard hour minute format. So while we're on this uh, particular train of thought, there is a way to convert hours to minutes and I have listed it uh, here. You essentially take the uh, unit of hours and multiply that by 60 and once you've done that you add the minutes. So for example with my June 2017 projected hours I have a total of 58 hours and 35 minutes projected. So I would take the 58 and I would multiply that by 60. That gets me a total of 3,480 minutes corresponding to the 58 hours, but I also have to account for the 35 minutes. So if I add the 35 minutes, when I take that and combine it with the 3,480, that gets me a ground total of 3,515 minutes when I convert uh, my projected hours from hour minute format into just minute format. Conversely, if I want to convert minutes to hours, I would take the total minutes and divide it by 60 I would then multiply the corresponding decimals by 60 and then combine both numbers. So let's take the 3515 that we just calculated. If we divide that by 60, 
we get a total of 58.58333. This isn't particularly useful to us um, when we're thinking in terms of time, um, at least the decimal portion. So what we do know when dividing 3515 by 60 is that 58 hours are involved, and then there is a fractional number that we need to convert uh, into minutes. So to do that, we would just take the fractional portion, so these, uh, these numbers here, 0.58333, and multiply it by 60. That gets us a number of 35. So we then combine the 58 hours and 35 minutes, and voila, we have 58.35, right back where we started. If I were to then go back to the example with list item number one, we have 282 minutes listed. So if we wanted to apply our knowledge here, we would take 282 and then we would divide that by 60 And that would get us our um, number of hours and minutes, if we happened to want that. Just uh, roughly off the top of my head, this is going to be um, the better part of four hours. 240 is going to correspond to four hours. And then uh, 42 minutes on top of that with the leftover minutes here. So that would end up being 4 hours and 42 minutes. EQP is short for equipment. That should be fairly self-explanatory. In this case, list item number 1 uh, was completed on a 767. Employee status uh, this is usually just going to be one of two things. This will be either flight attendant or service director. For the vast majority of us, it will just be one or the other. However, we do have um, some people who happen to do both uh, based on their seniority, especially now with uh, the number of recalls where uh, some of our SDs are flying as flight attendants. Uh, and that can include being on reserve, where they might get called for a uh, service director um, pairing, or they might get called for a flight attendant pairing. So this particular item, or uh, column, pardon, uh, indicates whether it is a uh, flight attendant or service director, um, as far as the status of any of us as an employee when working that particular uh, segment. Service code is something that's used by payroll to indicate where on the pay progression scale that we lie. So in this case, 01 refers to the first part of the pay progression scale, and this makes sense because this is within the first several months that I was employed at Air Canada, so that is me uh, at the first um, tier in terms of the entire pay progression. This number goes up as you progress in tiers. Description will indicate um, any additional information that will help us figure out uh, what's going on. Um, for example, with list item number one, 100 hours is equivalent to what we would call VE or voluntary extension. We'll get more into uh, how to um, calculate and interpret this, but suffice to say um, this is an example of um, what can show up in this column to help us differentiate. DPG, that's our duty period guarantee, similar idea, deadhead, standby while on reserve, uh, that's a, just several of the options that you might have show up here. Action code is no longer applied um, 
to any of our pay statements. So it's just there from, I imagine, remnants of a previous contract, uh, but not something that we use at this time. Finally, we have pay minutes. Uh, this is going to be one that is key uh, since we want to make sure our pay is being calculated correctly. Once upon a time, there was a day rate and a night rate as far as how minutes were paid out. Um, that's no longer something that we go by. Um, so the day and the total column are more or less identical. Uh, just to be safe, you can just go ahead and use the total column and you can compare to see um, how things are paid out for you in minutes. Note that sometimes uh, what shows up in the total pay minutes uh, you will not see corresponding in flight minutes. So for list item number one you can see 282 for both flight minutes and total minutes and this makes sense because uh, this is an actual flight that transpired. If we go just several down to list item number three, we can see that uh, there is a zero for flight minutes, uh, but there is 27 in total for pay minutes. The reason for this is because uh, this is a duty period guarantee top up, so this isn't related to any actual flying time that I completed that day. Um, this is just making sure that I get paid my minimum of uh, four hours or 240 minutes. Same idea with deadhead, uh, much further down. Uh, let's go to the very bottom just to make it easier to separate. You'll see a zero in the flight minutes column, but you will see 150 in the pay minutes column. Now the reason for this is um, the pay minutes do not necessarily correspond to the actual amount of time spent in flight. For a Toronto to Vancouver flight, 150 minutes would be extremely good uh, because no Vancouver <laughs> Toronto or Toronto Vancouver flight that I know of has ever been that short. That would be um, two and a half hours, which would be just simply amazing. <laughs> uh, the reason why 150 is here is because uh, as far as our flight time credit is concerned, whenever we deadhead, uh, we get uh, half of the flight time credit. So just to make it uh, a little bit more difficult for us, uh, for whatever reason under flight minutes, it's a zero whenever there is a deadhead. Uh, but if you really want to know what the flight time was, you can take the pay minutes and multiply it by two. That has the same effect. All right. So we've covered a little bit of how to navigate flight information. The very next section uh, that you will see is flight duty credits. Now flight information as we've seen is akin to what our schedules look like and flight duty credits will show how that is paid in turn. Now the index number that we talked about before uh, that corresponds to both flight information and flight duty credits. So index as we saw here will also correspond to index that we see over here in flight duty credits. So under pay minutes in total over in flight information, we saw that it was 282 minutes. If we go to flight duty credits, we will see that 282 minutes is here as well. So far, this is all information that we've seen over on the left. We see an index item number of one. We see that uh, we're being paid as flight attendants, which we saw over here with employee status. We're seeing that uh, we have a service code of one, which corresponds to service code over in flight information. We are seeing that this was completed on a 767. 
For any of us who are flight attendants, uh, this is a little less important because we don't get paid differently based on aircraft type. Uh, service directors, however, are paid differently based on aircraft type. So for service directors um, on reserve, uh, note that your rate, which we can see over here, would change according to the aircraft type. But for the purposes of simplifying uh, this basic walkthrough, we are going through my flight attendant flight summary, where the rate of pay is the same regardless of aircraft. So rate is new information. Um, we will cover um, on a subsequent page um, just how this is calculated. Remember, with everything we calculate in minutes. So if you wanted to determine your rate per hour, you would take the rate here and multiply it by 60, and that would get you your rate per hour. There is a chart in the collective agreement that shows what your pay rate per hour should be, and that will correspond to um, the part of the pay progression that you are presently at. So with the pay rate here, I have 0.43567 for my rate per minute, and the number of minutes I've worked is 282. So when multiplying 282 by 0.43567, the amount that I get for having worked that flight is $122.86. A similar process is um, completed for every single index item that you saw in flight information over in flight duty credits in turn. And then you arrive at a final total once everything in the amount column has been calculated. Now once in a while there are index items that don't actually end up getting paid. This uh, particular flight summary was easier for me because just about everything uh, did end up getting paid, whereas on some um, flight summaries, uh, this is not always the case. You'll especially see this once you become a block holder when there's, uh, when there's pay protection involved. But uh, for reserve, it's actually a little bit easier in the sense there's really only a handful of times you don't get paid for an index item. And let's look at one of those cases. So index item number 17, I did a little bit of airport standby. So if we look at flight information, I did that for one hour. That was from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Vancouver airport. We can see it was at Vancouver because the departure station and the arrival station was the same. Vancouver both times. The category listed was standby reserve. So in this particular case, I had worked as a flight attendant deadheading back. Now this deadheading was me coming back from Toronto to Vancouver. We see that in list item number 16, just one above. So once I got back from Toronto, crew scheduling asked me to stand by at the Vancouver airport for one hour. My duty day finished after this, but I wasn't paid for my standby time, and that's because of several factors. We'll go back and look uh, at the other items, 15 and 16, and we can determine why based on looking at those. These are all part of the same duty day. So item number 15 is DPG. That would be my duty period guarantee. I am being paid for 90 minutes. And the reason for that is because with list item number 16, I'm showing as a deadhead and it was 150 minutes. 150 minutes for a deadhead, as we know, uh, that is Toronto, Vancouver. Um, so two and a half hours is fairly unlikely for an actual flight time. So um, 
five hours was the actual flight time, but two hours and 30 minutes is the only bit of credit that I got. As per the collective agreement, we have to be paid for four hours at minimum. So DPG, duty period guarantee, is topping up the 150 uh, to make it 240 minutes, and that would be four hours, which is our duty day minus four, uh, or minimum pay of four hours on duty. So with the flight time having been five hours, and then a little bit of time before that for check-in in Toronto, and the one hour of airport standby after, I'm not entitled to any more pay because I've already been topped up to four hours. Um, and as per duty day minus four, I'm not entitled to any more pay. So we see that standby reserve, my total in pay minutes in flight information was zero. So when I look over at list item number 17, since it's zero that I'm entitled to, <laughs> they're not bothering to put anything into here at all. So that is in effect zero. Sometimes on uh, your flight summary, they won't even add the list item at all. Uh, so you would see it go from 16 directly to 18 and line 17 omitted. In this case, they decided to add it without putting any of the numbers in, uh, but other times you might just see absolutely nothing, uh, and that's normal. Uh, not all of the index items that you see in flight information end up making it over to flight duty credits. So let's talk about the minimum monthly guarantee adjustment. We went through a fairly complicated uh, flight summary of mine. Uh, so I've pulled up a much easier one, and that's from my first month of flying. I finished training back in May of 2017, and my first day available on duty was May the 20th. I ended up having a total of 12 days where I was available on payroll, and I even got lucky and got a call to operate one pairing in that month. So let's talk first about the minimum monthly guarantee. You've probably heard of this in some form, but if not, uh, when you're on reserve, uh, assuming that you haven't called in sick uh, without any sick days left, uh, assuming that you haven't been unavailable for duty, uh, basically assuming everything is normal, uh, you are entitled to 75 hours of pay regardless of how much you actually fly. Keeping in mind that we do everything in minutes when looking at our pay statements, 75 hours converts to 4,500. Uh, 4,500 is the magical amount of minutes you are always looking to have your um, pay add up to at minimum. If you are off payroll um, for any days in a block month, your minimum monthly guarantee is reduced by two hours and 25 minutes uh, for each of those days off payroll, and that corresponds to 145 minutes per day. So let's uh, get into the calculation of my minimum monthly guarantee. There are two major components to it. We have total pay minutes, so that's what I actually ended up flying and got paid for in the block month. And then there's basic minimum guarantee. So we already covered that basic minimum guarantee is 75 hours. Uh, and total pay minutes uh, in this case, let's just break it down right now. So there are three index items um, for this entire block month. And all of them are fairly straightforward. Index item number one is my first flight. I actually worked this flight. It departed at 1.45 p.m. Vancouver time and arrived in Toronto at 9.05 Eastern time. The total number of minutes of the flight was 260, and so in turn, I'll be paid 260 minutes for that flight. Item number two, this one is a little bit odd. <laughs> it's showing uh, 345 
to 107 a.m. and that's in part because uh, this isn't an actual flight. Um, as we can see there is no flight number here nor any departure scheduled date because this doesn't correspond to a flight. There's zero flight minutes as well. What this corresponds to is DPG, duty period guarantee. So I'm being paid to uh, top up the duty period to make sure that the duty day minus four rule is being observed. So I was topped up with an additional 90 minutes. Let's have a look at why that might be. It's showing in index item number three where the departure time is 11.03 p.m. Eastern Time and then arrives back in Vancouver at 1.07 a.m. and that is specific time. We can see zero for the flight minutes and the reason for that is because in this case it was a deadhead. 152 minutes is what was paid and that's because for a deadhead you are paid at half the flight time credit so the actual flight time credit for this was uh, 304 minutes, uh, but with a deadhead only paid 152. So the 90 in duty period guarantee was to top up because um, for the duty period that I had when duty day minus four was applied, I was not given enough flight time credit. So the 90 minutes makes up the difference for that. 260 plus 90 plus 152 equals 502 minutes. This ends up being the total pay minutes that gets used here in the minimum guarantee adjustment, which we will talk about fairly shortly. So applying the flight time credits with index item number one in flight information that corresponds to flight duty credits where I flew 260 minutes. So paid at a rate of 0.43567, the amount is 113.27 and so on for all three of the uh, list items in flight duty credits that match up to the three items in flight information. Those all totaled end up being $218.70. So that's all of my total pay minutes covered. The 502 pay minutes end up being $218.70. So now we have to get to the minimum guarantee adjustment. If you are unavailable for any portion of a block month, as mentioned before, the uh, MMG is reduced in turn. So in this case, we see a section in the minimum guarantee adjustment that refers to reduced minimum guarantee calculation. In here, it mentions that I was only available for 12 payroll days out of a total of 31 block days. We can see information about this in this section further up that's entitled absence miscellaneous information. <laughs> I still laugh every time I see this uh, because the description provided here was termination, <laughs> but that's actually not uh, technically correct. So what happened is uh, I was still in initial training for a portion of May and that was for a total of 19 days. Technically termination refers to a change of job category where training has been completed, which it was effective May the 19th. Um, and in turn, I switched to a category of being flight attendant instead of trainee. So description of termination, it looks scary. Um, you perhaps will see this if you are a fairly new hire in your schedule. This does not mean that you lost your job. It just means that you are no longer a trainee. Uh, and the number of days that correspond to that uh, are the number of days that you are uh, technically unavailable. 
Since you're paid in a different way for training, um, you in turn can't double dip in the minimum guarantee. So those days from training are uh, reduced from your minimum guarantee calculation. As a result, 31 total block days if I were to be available for all of these days, but I was not. So 31 minus 19 ends up being 12 in terms of my total days available on payroll. I can count them as well. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that all corresponds with that screenshot of my globe that I took. So we mentioned before, uh, when calculating how everything was paid out under flight duty credits, that $218.70 is uh, what was earned as a result of that flying time. But we need the top up. So here we have the top up calculated and paid out. So as with everything else, the rate is 0.43567 per minute and 1,243 is the number of minutes that we are owed for top up and that is exactly what's paid out here. And that ends up with $541.54. And that gets carried over here into the area labeled total minimum guarantee adjustment. So then finally, you would take the 21870, add it to 54, and you end up with a flight duty credit total of $760.24. Ground duty credits and per diems. This will be the last section that we get into when covering um, the basics. We'll just very briefly touch on ground duty credits just because this can get complicated fairly quickly. Um, suffice to say that uh, ground duty credits um, are paid at one half of your hourly rate uh, because uh, it is taking place on the ground. Uh, this is referred to as well as being paid by a factor of 50. Why it can't just be uh, 50% or something a little bit more straightforward uh, for the uh, average reader, I am not sure. Uh, but factor and 50, which you see under pay info in the ground duty credits, that basically means that you would take the rate and then just uh, it would be 50% of that rate. So in this case, the ground duty credit is uh, the pre-post. Uh, that's something we can cover another time, but basically for certain aircraft types, uh, the largest ones, sometimes you have to check in more than one hour before departure time. And in that case, uh, that extra time is paid at ground rate, and that ends up getting calculated here under ground duty credits. So it would be 15 minutes of ground duty at that rate, but half of that rate. So the easiest way to calculate this manually is to take the 15 minutes, multiply 15 by that rate, and then divide by 2. That effectively is the same thing as multiplying by 0.5. Um, whichever you prefer to do is fine. The final total in this case is $3.27. Meal allowances are otherwise known as per diems, and these are calculated using Article 7.02 in our collective agreement. In 7.02, there are several important items of note. There are specific meal periods that we observe uh, whenever we are in a pairing, and these are used to help us determine um, which of the allowances we are eligible for while we're away from base or while we're on airport standby. Departures and arrivals might make it seem like this is convoluted, but uh, there's actually a fairly simple way to look at this, so I will provide that for you. 
the easiest way to think about it is for departures, this is going to apply to help us figure out the first meal allowance that we are entitled to. So departures can be thought of as a departure from home base. Arrivals, in turn, is used to help us figure out the last meal allowance that we are entitled to. And that would be um, arriving back to home base. Just to make things simple, you may have noticed that there are two dinner items under recognized meal periods. Uh, the first dinner item here, uh, this refers to um, what's known as a night dinner or special dinner, depending on who you talk to. Um, this is something that is rarely paid because there's a certain number of circumstances uh, and criteria that have to be met in order for this uh, special dinner to be paid out. So it's easier just to skip over that one um, and use the dinner that's further down during uh, the standard dinner hours that you are more accustomed to uh, and that would be what you would see most of the time when dinner is being paid. So if we look at breakfast, for example, you will see departures 0800 to 0930. So between 8 a.m. and 9.30 a.m., uh, that's considered the breakfast meal period. In order to be paid a breakfast, you would have to have a duty period that starts prior to 8 a.m. Precisely at 8 a.m. unfortunately does not entitle you to the per diem. It's a very odd nuance, um, but the meal period must be um, entirely within your duty day. So 7.59 a.m. would be the earliest um, as far as your duty day starting, uh, or the latest, pardon me, uh, where you would still be eligible for a breakfast. The only exception to this is airport standby. and so on and so forth for all the departure times for lunch. Again, you would have to have a um, duty period that starts at 12.29 p.m. or earlier, 5.59 p.m. or earlier for dinner, and 10.59 p.m. or earlier for snack. For arrival back at home base to determine the last meal allowance you're entitled to, you'll see that um, for the most part it's the same um, with the exception of dinner, where there's a slightly different uh, time span, and that's to assist um, people who are based on the East Coast so that they are entitled to uh, dinner meal allowances more often. So in this case, uh, your duty period has to be at least one minute past the very end of the meal period. So you would have to arrive at 9.31 a.m. or later to be entitled to breakfast. You would have to arrive back at home base at um, 1.31 p.m. or later, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at the same flight information that we had from my May 2017 um, block month. So there's just three items. So the very first one, as mentioned before, was me uh, departing at 1.45 p.m. So we'll just do a little bit of basic uh, deduction here. Not entitled to breakfast. And then with uh, 1.45 being the departure time, that also happens to be past the lunch meal period. So not entitled to lunch either. 1.45 is definitely before 6 p.m. So in this case, dinner is a per diem that I am entitled to. When looking at the deadhead flight coming back to Vancouver, the arrival time back at home base in Vancouver is 1.07 a.m. 
when looking in the arrivals column. My arrival time is past 1 a.m. So in that case, I was on duty for the entire mural period and in turn, I am entitled to the snack per diem. Now, how do we determine what the amount is? In Article 7.02.02, we have a breakdown of the Canada and United States meal allowances. The number is the same for both Canada and the US, except that uh, the number is in US dollars um, for any of our US destinations. So it would be uh, on a monthly basis that a, um, a PDF is uploaded to Aeronet where it has a breakdown of um, the same numbers that you're used to for Canada and then the monthly changing number for the US since of course the US dollar exchanges differently every day. And then there's also um, more set numbers for meal allowances at other locations and that's covered in 7.02.03. Um, US uh, amounts change monthly, but other locations do not change quite so frequently. There is an effective date uh, for per diems. This changes every year. So in this case, because it was 2017, um, I will circle the column that applies. It's the 2017 column since this was in May of 2017. So we covered that I am entitled to a dinner in this particular scenario. So the dinner amount was 3506. And when I look at the crew cycle expenses table, I look for the day that corresponds, the 28th of May, and I see that 3506 was in fact paid. I look at list item number three, and I can see that on um, that particular flight segment, I arrived back in Vancouver on May the 29th, so early in the morning on the 29th. And accordingly, the snack is showing under crew cycle expenses on the 29th, and it's 916, which matches what we see in the column for meal allowances. Those numbers are totaled, so there is just one per diem for each of the days that this pairing covered. Those added together equal 4422. There are several other items that can show up under crew cycle expenses. CICO refers to a check-in check-out gratuity. That's $5.05. That's for any time you have a layover on a pairing. Uh, transportation, the next column over, is not something we usually use, so it's mostly always going to be zero. We have a uniform cleaning allowance monthly, and that totals to 45. There are several other items that will show up less frequently, such as um, such as the uh, passport um, cost that is covered by the company up to a certain number. That will show up under crew cycle expenses uh, if you were to put in a claim for that. And all that to say, with value, when you add 44.22 for any of the crew cycle expenses and 45 for the uniform cleaning allowance, you end up with a grand total of 89.22. And that would be in crew cycle expenses. So in this case, my per diems were paid correctly for this block month. I hope this uh, gives you some ideas as far as how to check your flight summary and ensure that you are being paid correctly. If anything uh, is not showing up the way that it uh, you believe it should be, uh, you would put in an e-claim through Aeronet and you would indicate um, what you are entitled to as far as uh, a, a meal allowance if that's missing, as far as uh, flight time credit if that's missing, and then uh, payroll looks at that and approves or rejects those e-claims. Um, if there are any issues where uh, they reject a claim and you still believe that it should be uh, accepted, then it would be best to reach out to your local 
and they'll be able to assist you in de de determining the validity of uh, any of those claims that you are trying to make. This is not by any means an exhaustive uh, look at some of the different items that will show up in your flight summary on reserve, but these are some of the most common. Thanks for following along. Um, again, my name is Jesse Matthews. You can reach me at the uh, Vancouver local by email at reserve at local4094.ca and I'd be more than happy to answer any of your reserve related questions. Thank you very much and take care.